Up next this week on Why Am I Doing This to Myself Resident Evil Edition, we have Code Veronica X. The original Resident Evil Code Veronica was released for the Dreamcast in 2000 and was originally intended to be Resident Evil 3, and Nemesis was supposed to be a spin-off game. However, for reasons I can't remember and am too lazy to Google, Nemesis became Resident Evil 3 and Code Veronica became the spin-off. After Capcom came to the mind-blowing revelation that having a Resident Evil game exclusive to a dying breed wasn't a great way to cover your losses, Resident Evil Code Veronica was ported to the PlayStation 2 and eventually the game cube in the form of Code Veronica X. Actually, while digging around for this video, I found that there's actually a fan remake of Code Veronica in the works that's based on the uh, Resident Evil 2 and Resident Evil 3 remakes, which I'll hopefully be able to talk about someday. Now keep in mind, this is the fourth Resident Evil game I've played in a row, and I typically don't have the attention span for that many games of this kind in succession. Succession. I said succession, not success. Fuck. Especially after Resident Evil 2 remake, I was feeling pretty burnt out. This is probably because I went from playing through Resident Evil remake to three straight playthroughs of Resident Evil Village in a week, followed by three runs of Resident Evil 2 Remake in a week. And following that, the Resident Evil game I had lined up to play next was one that I had never played before, which just kind of made it seem like more work. I'll be honest, it took me a day or so to really muster up the energy to sit down and devote time to giving Code Veronica an honest shot. Saying I had never played it isn't quite true. I played it once when I was about 11. I had a babysitter who put on the man in the iron mask, which just couldn't hold my attention, so I went into the other room to play Dreamcast. Out of her small stack of games, Code Veronica was there, and I decided to take advantage of the opportunity to play it since she didn't know I wasn't allowed to play Resident Evil games at home yet. I had to play a lot of Resident Evil games like this as a kid. The first time I remember my dad allowing me to play one, I think I was 15, so before then I had to play them at friends' houses or borrow a PSP memory card that had an old school Resident Evil downloaded from the PSN. This is the main reason I added this game to the marathon. I thought it would be a good time to finally knock it off my list because it's been sitting on my shelf for years, and while I've thought about it several times, I haven't actually taken the time. Now that I have, I have to say I'm really glad I did. Like like I said, I came into this game really dreading the fact that I was only halfway through the six games I had picked out, but Code Veronica X really gave me a second win that's got me more amped up to finish this thing through to the end. The biggest factor I think in this has to be the level design. This is a really well put together Resident Evil game, and in my opinion the best of the old school Resident Evil games that came out prior to Resident Evil Remake in 2002. It takes place on an island with multiple small locations built into the overall map before eventually moving to another late game location. So early on in the game you unlock almost the entire map and you have to go between the early parts of the late game to find items that you need to unlock parts in the early part of the game. When phrased that way, it may not sound too different from what other old school Resident Evil games do, but this game does it differently. For instance, imagine if in order to finish the first part of the mansion in Resident Evil 1, you needed an item that you can only pick up out in the residence quarters or whatever they called it with the plants and shit. But once you got to that area, most of it was locked off for later and there was an item you needed for an earlier puzzle. Instead of three big areas, i.e. mansion, garden, labs, or police station sewer labs, it was five or six smaller areas that were all really close together and all needed to be explored simultaneously in order to solve the one big puzzle that spread across the whole map. This goes even as far as old puzzle items you don't think you'll need becoming important later on. To put it more simply, the combination of puzzle and map design play more to me in the vein of something like Myst rather than a traditional Resident Evil game, and I like that a lot. This game is also a lot less combat heavy than a lot of other Resident Evil games I played, at least for the early parts. I mean, there's still zombies everywhere, but there's only like one real boss fight in the first half of the game and only a couple actual fights between that one and the final boss. You'll spend a lot of the early game avoiding combat in certain spots because as you'll find, there's not a lot of healing items laying around until you get later on into the game. This may be because I suck, but I spent most of the game in caution mode. There were a lot of times where I would go run around without fighting or healing and just trying to solve puzzles and see how far I could go. A lot of times I was able to make it, but even if I didn't, I would learn where certain things were and go back to solve puzzles more efficiently since I knew what was coming. There are three things I want to mention that do irritate me about this game. One, there are rooms that you never need to go into until way later in the game that are filled with really strong enemies that I guess they put in as a deterrent. And on top of that, they'll often be off camera, so you start taking damage immediately immediately going through a door and you can't anticipate it because you're basically blind, and that's bullshit. Two, I had to look up a walkthrough to solve a major puzzle I needed to finish the game because it involved going into a building that I didn't know was there because I couldn't see the door due to a camera angle and just how dark this game is. I am keeping in mind that I'm playing on a PS2 on a high-def TV and that games were made for CRTs and the HD TVs are darker with the black levels or whatever some shit, I don't know. But still, I spent a couple of hours running around the map and wasting supplies trying to solve a puzzle that I couldn't solve, not because I didn't know what to do, but because I couldn't see the door. Even after I looked up where the door was, I still had to run along that wall mashing X because I couldn't see it. So keep that in mind if you ever find yourself playing through this. And three, this is one of those games where it's possible to break your save file. 
My first playthrough of the game, I was actually able to back myself into a corner at the end I couldn't get out of, and therefore I had to start the whole game over. Most of that was my fault, but part of it does go on the developers. See, early on in the game, you don't have an item box at a save point until you get to a certain area. Everything before that, you have to carry things in your inventory, and then the only thing you have is a little box where a puzzle's involved. So having limited space, you might leave used puzzle items not thinking about them, and if you don't go back and get them before a certain point in the game, you can't get the magnum you don't need the magnum to complete the game but it damn sure helps on top of that going back to what i said earlier about how the puzzle solving in this game reminds me more of something like mist i mean that in both the good and the bad senses yes the world is expansive and solving puzzles in one area later on relates to older puzzles in older areas which is great and i wish more resident evil games were like that on the other side of this coin it means that multiple puzzles required to solve a puzzle can be done in any order in certain areas however the game designers want to steer you towards solving certain puzzles in a particular order so they kill you for trying to explore and it's fucking annoying. Moving forward, the main, I say with huge quotation marks, villain in the game, Alfred Ashford, is definitely in my top five Resident Evil villains ever. He's up there with Salazar from Resident Evil 4. Actually, speaking of Salazar, there's a stuffed doll in this game as part of a background that looks exactly like Salazar. Maybe that's a reference they made to Code Veronica in Resident Evil 4. But also, on the opposite side of that hallway, there's another doll that looks exactly like Angie from Resident Evil Village. So I'm thinking that's another reference made in Resident Evil Village toward older Resident Evils, but I digress. What I love about Sir Alfred is that he's both this absolute child who absolutely has no concept of how deep in the shit he really is, as well as being genuinely crazy. He's not an intimidating villain, but more of this slightly off, possibly a future Dahmer type of guy who you get a good understanding of throughout the game. It becomes pretty clear that he has absolutely no idea why any of this is happening, and he thinks the choices of his ancestors are normal. Eventually, you start to get the idea that he has really no concept of reality, but you can't really blame him towards the end after the plot unveils. Spoiled rich, yes, but the guy never had a chance in life. I have to say, environmental storytelling is the part of Code Veronica that's most finely crafted. All the puzzles, as well as their items, tell another part of the story surrounding the island, the people on it, and as well as its greater part in the history of the Umbrella Corporation. As you play through, you will slowly start to figure out everything that's gone on here over the past century. How the Ashford family went from old royalty to the founders of the Umbrella Corporation. There's a section of this game that involves a private residence on top of the island that belongs to Sir Alfred and his sister, Alexia Ashford. This is one of those areas that you stop into briefly early on to get an item and then you come back to later on after you've used said item to open another area. There's this huge mannequin hanging in the main area that at first just seems like a creepy prop, but eventually when you end up back here towards the end of the game, you've learned more about the story that you'll eventually understand why it's hanging up there in the first place and it makes sense in context of the characters. Plus, I do think that this game does serve to add a nice piece of lore to the Resident Evil series, and it struck me recently that other than a particular older Resident Evil villain that makes a cameo appearance in a couple scenes here, there really is no bad guy in the traditional sense. All of the evil decisions were made by people who were long dead and left their family to pick up the pieces of the mess that they'd made. And while they're obviously the antagonist, I'm still a little bit sympathetic to their situation. There's this guy named Steve, too, who you run into at the beginning and play through parts of the game with. He's kind of whiny and his dialogue is corny because this is a Resident Evil game, but he's clearly played by a Canadian voice actor, and it kind of cracks me up when I hear that accent come out. I don't really have much to say about Steve. He's kind of goofy, but he's also a cuck. There's a part where we literally say his life and then we ask him for an item we need to solve a puzzle and he says he'll only trade it for a different item with the infliction of Laura from Silent Hill 2 before kicking James in the shin. All in all, while his presence did barely register to me for a majority of the game, I'd be lying if I said his plotline didn't end up affecting me a little bit towards the end. Say, do you guys remember in my last Resident Evil video, my RE2 remake, where I complained about how the A and B campaign should have been one interlocking story with a well-established timeline, considering how the story characters interact at certain points for plot's sake? Of course you don't, because nobody watches these videos. Well, Resident Evil Code Veronica delivers on that front. What we have here isn't a game with two playable characters in A and B scenarios. What we have is one long campaign that switches back and forth between Chris and Claire Redfield as it continues, and it's exactly what what I wanted. This is a long game. I mean, it's easily 15 to 20 hour campaign for a first playthrough, and it's awesome. You play through about the first two thirds of the game as Claire before the perspective switches over to Chris and picks up slightly earlier than where Claire leaves off. Plus, if you pick up or leave an item in a room as Claire, that affects whether or not Chris can pick it up as he covers your tracks. And that's a really great focus on continuity there. This is probably the biggest reason why the game gave me second wind, as I mentioned earlier, and even though I had to start it over, I'm glad I finally saw it through to the end. So if you're thinking of trying this one out, 
out. I highly recommend it. However, I wouldn't judge you for using a walkthrough. Later, 